how do you respond to Christians when they say they believe in Jesus because of the proof, the proof that there was no body found in the tomb? That's, that's why they believe in Jesus. Welcome to Tanak Talk. I'm your host, William Hall, broadcasting live from Kingsman, Texas, USA, with another episode of Rabbi Tobia Singer's Let's Get Biblical Q&A. Bringing to you live for our sweet Rabbi, Rabbi Tobia, the man, Singer. Welcome back. I'll uh, say the man because we might get mis- mistaken for a Mashiach, you know, like Jesus. Anyway, that was a stupid dad joke. That, ha- um, that was very good. That was good. For a Gentile, that was good. <laughs> for a hey, Jew, so- you'd be, you'd get a little sick. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Well, we all missed you last week. Uh, I know you had to cancel your show because your dad wasn't doing well. Um, and so, if you don't mind, how, how was he doing? Yeah, now? yeah. How's so, actually, you know, I, I came back to Israel um, like, a, I don't know, about a week and a half ago, we did that show. And then uh, my dad's um, my dad's health took a, a dramatic a turn for the worse. Mm. And it, it would be hard to imagine how that could be possible, yet it did. So um, I need your prayers. Sure. You know, I'm here with my dad. That's why I'm back here in the United States. Uh, my dad's name is Shlomo Zalman Hakohen Ben Leo. And so okay. my dad has a few. Um, um, procedures to go through, and he needs a refuah shalema, a complete recovery. I am deeply grateful to all of you who have kept my dad in your prayers. Deeply grateful to you. Thank you so much. Okay. So yeah, so had a turnaround almost immediately. Okay, and gotcha. get back here so I could, yeah. You know, well, we certainly, certainly appreciate your time, especially in this uh, in this intense yeah. in this intense time we're having Absolutely. right now. Absolutely. Um, okay. Um, all right. Just moving forward, uh, guys. Keep an eye on the audio um, because there's a setting I did, I couldn't change, and I can't I can't get into it. My computer's not letting me in to change that. Is my audio okay? Your audio sounds good. I did it. I did it. Yeah. Uh, question. Everybody says it sounds good so far, but when I switch screens and have you full screen, it might echo. Uh, I'm going to switch you now, just so I can get this ahead of time before we interrupt something. Rabbi, go ahead and just say hi real fast. Oh yeah, hi real fast. That 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 was pretty nice. You did. did, Yeah, you follow instructions very well. (laughs) You know, when you go through the conversion process, (laughs) your your um, oratory skills are going to go up considerably. Your sense of humor is going to go through the roof, (laughs) and. You know, so that's really exciting. We're really, we're really, really hoping that you'll uh, go through that process, and we're looking forward to that. You're, you're awesome. Okay. Well, I am. <laughs> yes, you are. Very awesome. Okay, cool. Well, with that being said, let's move right on into this. I love, I love this. This is. Um, go ahead. Yeah, I, this is good. Man, you guys just never quit. Okay, I'm in Deuteronomy 22:14, King James only. Deuteronomy 22:14, and give occasion to speech against her and bring up any evil name upon her and say, I took this woman when I came to her. I found her not a maid. King James says maid. Guess what the guess what it says on Kabbalah.org. I took this woman and when I came to her, I did not find any evidence of virginity for her. Huh? Mm. Look at that. You used virginity. It must not be Alma. Right. But the word is synonymous with maid, virginity, and maid. Yep. You got holes in your little screen, buddy. You got holes in your garment. You're wrong. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, that, that's uh, very insightful. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, you know, it's, it's interesting. So, the first, thank you very much for your call. And I think you kind of gave it away right at the beginning when you said that you're a King James only guy, which means that you place 
the King James, a translation that was published in 1611, 47 men in good standing with the Church of England translated the Tanakh, and I use the word translated in quotation marks, the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament into English. And they translated it into Jacobian English. That's not as difficult as, that's not as foreign as, let's say, Middle English, which you would probably not understand. But Jacobian English, you would. But it has, Jacobian English, the King James, employs of many anachronisms. But in that, you would place the a Christian King James Bible written a dozen years after the Merchant of Venice, you would place that above the Word of God is mind-blowing, really is. It's interesting, intriguing, that you raised Isaiah 22. Uh, and I think just some explanation is necessary here. So as it turns out, uh, two out of the 27 books in the Christian Bible claim that Jesus was supernaturally conceived. You'll find this what's called an infancy narrative in four chapters out of 89 chapters in the Gospels. Two chapters in Matthew, two of them in Luke. What's striking about Matthew is that Matthew has the... <laughs> Has the, I don't even know the right word for it. Matthew actually claims that the book of Isaiah foretold that the Messiah was to be uh, conceived to a virgin, and that was the sign. And whoever wrote the book of Matthew has this so wrong and completely mistranslated, deliberately mistranslated, Isaiah 7, 14. And there are things he did that he doesn't even realize because that, that's what happens when you're, you're, when you're messing with text. So Isaiah 7, 14 says, alma hora that behold, the young woman is with a child, present tense, definite article, v'koros shimo Emmanuel, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God is with us. In this case, Emmanuel is conveying to the southern kingdom of Judah. At that time, Israel was in the midst of a, a civil war and that God was going to protect the southern kingdom of Judah. Not because Ahaz was so righteous or deserved it, but rather because the Davidic dynasty must be preserved. God made a promise to King David going back to Second Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 through 16. So Matthew famously mistranslates the word Alma. Alma means a young woman. King David says, you know, you know, Hixarte you may alumov, you have cut off the the days of my Youth, it doesn't mean virginity. King David wasn't a virgin, and King David is also called in Elam, the masculine version, in in First Samuel chapter 17, verse 56. Was he also a virgin? How silly. Is there any Christian translation? Does your cherished King James 1611 translate... Um, these words as a maid or a virgin? The answer is, of course not, because they're playing a game. They're playing the game called hide the ball. They're playing with the word of God. And then they wonder, like, why Jews don't believe in Jesus. They find it very uncompelling. And the reason is because the whole thing's a scam. The whole thing's a scam. The sign, this is what Matthew completely flubs it, and Christians don't get it. The sign is not the conception of the child. There are some Christians who object and say, well, if a 
re- regular young woman conceived, then, and there's nothing supernatural, nothing unusual about how she conceived, or rather she conceived naturally, then there's no sign there. There's no sign because, of course, young women can get pregnant. I'm not going to say it's dumb. It's not dumb. These are good people. They just don't know. They don't. They mean well. The sign is not the conception or birth of the child. The sign is in verse 15 and 16. Butter and honey will the child eat when he knows to reject bad and choose good. For before he matures, these two kings, namely Pekach ben Ramayo, who's the king of, of the northern king of Israel, and um, Ritzin, who is the king of Syria, Syria, not Assyria, but Syria. And that was an alliance, an ill-conceived alliance. Okay. So this is all very silly. The sign is not the conception of the child, the birth of the child. It's the maturity of the child. Now, the proof you are bringing me, you're a Christian, you're bringing me, and you're... T- it's, it's very insightful to say that I have holes in my, what, nose? What did he say? <laughs> Whatever. The, the, the Torah, the context is, it's Deuteronomy chapter 22, the context, it's, it, the context is um, the laws concerning sexual relations. This Pusik is dealing with the case of a person who is Moitzi Shemra, who says something about a woman that's, that she's not a virgin, and he discovers that while he's having intercourse with her. V'som lo alilois devarim, and he um, put forward, he accused her of um, misconduct, misconduct because of his speech. V'hoitzi shemra, and release a negative shemra, a negative name, meaning he um, slandered her. So it's a sin of uh, calumny. Volmar and he said, I took this woman, the Ekrav Oleho, and I had sexual intercourse with her, and I didn't find any signs of virginity. She was not a virgin, she wasn't intact. I told you this a few times that this word Ekrav appears only twice in this exact formulation, only two times in Tanakh. Only in Deuteronomy 22.14, the, the passage you cite, and Isaiah chapter 8, verse 13, because it, it's talking about sexual intercourse. Vo'ekra, so the root is, is a very common word. Karov means to enter, to come close, like... The word carbon, even an offering, same root. Okay, so the word appears hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times throughout Tanakh. Hundreds. But this exact construct with the prefix and suffix and that, only twice in all of Tanakh. And it's conveying sexual intercourse. Isaiah says he had sex, the Ekrav El Hanavia, and I had sexual intercourse with the prophetess. Why does he go and say I had sexual? What do you, why did he talk that way? Because he in, knows that in 700 years later, there's going to be a religion, Christianity, that's going to claim that this child was conceived to a virgin. It's mind blowing what's going on. Now, here's where it gets where your argument really collapses. And I just want to say this to you guys who are King James only guys. I don't even understand why you're doing that. I really, I don't understand why someone would be a King James only person. Like that means there are people who think that the King James version was kind of divinely inspired. And it's the only legitimate translation of the Bible. I mean, it's the word of man. The King James Version has been redone a few times, quite a few times. And, and why? Because Jacobian English, while it's understandable, you, you would understand the 1611 King James, which is not the same as the King James. Today. I'm not talking about the new King James. But it's just 
the words fell out of use and the meaning of some words have changed. You know, that's just the nature of the game is that languages change. I mean, biblical Hebrew doesn't change because it's a holy language. It's preserved through Tanakh, through our prayers and so on. But the English language, the English language, dramatic. If you were, you're watching, you're listening to me right now, that means you're an English speaker, right? You understand the English language. If I was speaking in 14th century Middle English, you would have no idea what I'm talking about. Maybe you could take a guess at some words here and there. You wouldn't understand it. That's 14th century. 14th century. If you would read Chaucer, you'd have no idea. Really, you have no idea. But Hebrew is not like this. So the proof that you bring is really very silly. Why? Because the, the text says, Omar, and he'll say, I took this woman, and I had sexual intercourse for her, and I didn't find besulim. That's the word betula. It's the same word. Besulim means signs of virginity. He didn't find that she's a virgin. He discovered that she wasn't a virgin. So that's the whole proof. It's so crazy. This is the whole proof. It doesn't say... Um, it says virgin. The whole point of Deuteronomy 22, verse 14, the whole point of it is that a man is claiming that his new wife was not a virgin as he had assumed. You got it? And it uses the root of the word betula, not alma. It, it, using this text just demonstrates that Matthew altered the Hebrew Bible in order to make it appear Christological. Could there be a, a greater testimony to the malevolent intent of the author of the first gospel than the very passage you, a Christian, bring? I just would encourage you, I, I guess I upset you as a Christian, if I, I do, I think you should reconsider the way you address people who don't share your beliefs. Because if you talk that way, you're going to turn a lot of people off. But I'm used to it. I'm used to it. I'm cursed every day. Christians, they're, every day they attack me, they curse me. So that, that's just what happens. So it's all silly. Now, you, you probably still don't understand what the caller is saying. So if you go to the King James, this is very crazy. If you go to the King James, the end of Deuteronomy 22, 14 says, I found her not a maid. Okay? Now, almost every other English translation in 22, 14 says, I found her not a virgin. Okay? Now, the question is, ah, so... Um, the King James says that the word besulam means maid. I think what you're trying to say is because it's the word maid, as in maiden, and then there are translations that render Isaiah 7.14 as maiden, so therefore it's the same. I, I don't even think the callers understand the, the magnitude of this question. <laughs> I don't think you understand it, but this is the kind of stuff that Christians are often uh, dealing in. Why? Because this guy's a bad fellow? No. They never taught him Hebrew. Never. Never. By the way, if the King James is the Word of God, then why do they keep changing it? That means the King James is routinely updated with a few major updates. They just updated it. Why? Because language changes. I mean, the, the, a great deal of the King James Bible is borrowed from the Tyndale Bible, which was, Tyndale Bible is, um, is 16th century. It's like a, it's roughly 100 years older than the King James. Not quite, but it's about 100. So what, Tyndale was also the Word of God, that prophecy? In what universe does this go on? You know what universe this goes on in? It goes on in the universe of Christians who refuse to study Hebrew in easy language, a very easy language. Biblical Hebrew, 
less than 9,000 9, words, less than 9,000 words. You hear that? That's a, a tiny lexicon. So because in the King James, Deuteronomy 22, verse 14, ends with the word made for the word besulam somehow, and because the Chabad, I didn't look at it, but what are you doing? What are you talking about? So in conventional English, the, using the term made or maiden is an anachronism. We, we don't use that term anymore. The only, I, the only time we, we don't say, oh, let me introduce you to my sister-in-law, a fair maiden. No one talks that way. They did, I don't know, in old books, you know, in, when I was a kid, maybe, I don't know, in the Hardy Boy books, they may have talked that way. No one talks that way, so it's, it fell out of use in that sense. Now, if you mean a maid as in a helper or a cleaning lady, so that word is completely in use in conventional English. So the word maid will... That look, look at the fair maiden, people look at you like you're nuts. No one talks that way anymore. The King James is full of these anachronisms, but we can make out what it means. But So what are you talking about? The word there is virgin. The word English translation should cease to use the word maid unless they're talking about a cleaning lady or someone who's, I don't know, <laughs> Yeah, someone who's who's using the vacuum cleaner, who's running your Dyson D11 or V11. So this is all very, very silly. But if you, when you're ready to let go of your cherished, corrupt Christian translations and instead go to the original Hebrew, which all Christians believe Tanakh was written in Hebrew, like wh what did... What do Christians use in the 14th century? Like, what do they use? These divinely inspired translations? Translations are the word of men. Let's go to the word of God. In truth, there are 10 fulfillment citations of the book of Matthew. Every one of them, without exception, has been recklessly rendered, ripped out of context, mistranslated, in order to make it appear Christological. And this is why Christians, that I encounter are nice people. They just don't know what has been done to them. And all we're doing here is just setting out the truth. The sign is not the conception of a child. Alma means a young woman in Proverbs 30, verse 19 it, and 20. It is a married prostitute or a married uh, sinful woman who is, is an Alma. Cain der gave be Alma. She engages in fornication, takes a bath, and, and says, I didn't do anything wrong. How could the word Alma mean a virgin? It's so crazy. Okay? I don't mean to end it that way, but it's very important to get back to the original. If you're going to rely on Christian translations, you're in trouble. If you think the King James Version is the Word of God, I don't even know what to say to you. I really don't. And which version of the King James? This is a little silly. It's so silly. I mean, in, during, in the 17th century, early 17th century, there weren't even Jews in England. Jews were expelled from England. So this is a translation of, this, of the Church of England. That's all it is. And if you want to trust in a translation done by the, put together by the Church of England, Church of England, another brilliant idea, a church based on the family values of King Henry VIII. Go for it. Knock yourself out. It it really doesn't make sense. I would encourage Christians to really reconsider this approach, go back to the original Hebrew and look it up there. Thank you so much for your thoughtful question. All right. Very good. Well, we've got uh, another caller on, uh, Mr. Greg Slowride McBride. Welcome to the show, brother. <laughs> Well, hello there. How are you doing, sir? <laughs> How are you doing, man? What did he say? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I, have, I have a question about the priesthood of Hilkiah. And during that priesthood, they found the Torah. Uh, and the text reads like as if they had lost it and nobody had it because Hilkiah is very upset 
and makes everybody stand and read it and do it. And so is the was the priesthood operating with no Torah? And during the Babylonian exile, where was the Torah at? That is my question for the rabbi. All right. That's a great question, Greg, and I'm glad you asked it because I'm asked it frequently. So let's straighten this out. Greg, go ahead and hang up to me for your answer, brother. Thank you so much for your call. Okay. okay. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. All right. All right. Bye. During, God bless you. During, during this very tumultuous time, this is the end of the, toward the end of the first temple period, during the time of, Josiah during time of Yirmiyahu. So as it turns out, there was a Sefer Torah that was gone. It was missing. Which Sefer Torah is this? Not every Torah scroll in the world vanished. That's silly. Very silly. But rather, the Torah that was kept in the Ark, the, to- the, the Torah that was kept in the Beis Hamigis, that was very unique. That was very special. And that was lost. And when, like, Let's just a little point here that I think many people miss. During the period of the last um, century of the first temple period, the, a great deal of Jewish people were living outside the land of Israel. Every Torah scroll in the world disappeared. That doesn't even make sense. I mean, let's say there was a Torah scroll, a very special Torah scroll, in New York that disappeared, or in Jerusalem. Let's say a Torah, the Torah scroll in the great synagogue uh, in Yerushalayim, for whatever reason, disappeared, right? They actually have one Torah scroll in the great synagogue that on the Yom Arayim, on the high holidays, they, it's a very beautiful scroll, and the crown on it is solid gold. They actually keep it in a vault all year round, they bring the crown out. The, gra- the crown's not gold-leafed, it's solid gold. I don't know, someone once told me what its value is. So that's, that's a very special term. But if it, if, if it was somehow went missing, that doesn't mean people just forgot. Jeremiah didn't know the Torah. Like, he, he lived at that time. Zephaniah, Tsefania, didn't know the Torah. It's all very silly. What happens instead is the Torah is open, and it's open to a place that's not very good. It's open to the blessings and the curses. And what is going to happen to the king, that ultimately the king will be, your king will be taken away and um, to your land of your enemies. This, this was very troubling. And when it was brought to the prophetess to interpret, she she told Yoshiyahu, his name is Josiah, that you're a good man, you're a righteous man, so nothing's going to happen during your lifetime. But afterwards, terrible things are going to happen. We know what happened, the Babylonian exile. But Yoshiyahu, Josiah never saw this. Josiah, unfortunately, tragically, was killed in battle. He was He wasn't even 40 years old. And in an ill-conceived battle he waged with Egypt, he got killed. He was a, an archer, so I didn't know he was king. He fought with the soldiers in a unremarkable uniform. He's killed, and it causes a tremendous mourning. So the key is that don't believe for a moment that every Torah, like if a Torah scroll in London or in Jerusalem or disappeared, doesn't mean people would forget the Torah. I mean, people know it by heart. I know a lot of people who know the five books most by heart. This is not a big deal. (laughs) Everyone just had amnesia? Really? I don't think so. I think it's pretty silly. But it was one specific Torah scroll that, um, that was suddenly discovered after a very, very difficult time when it was hard to study Torah, when there was a tremendous persecution against the God of Israel and those who worshipped him. But not that every Torah in the world just suddenly disappeared. It was a very specific, very important Torah that was gone. And 
when it was discovered and where it was discovered, namely the blessings and the curses, which tell about the, your king will be taken away, will be carried away. Oh, that's already very ominous. He goes to a prophetess thinking that a female prophet would might give him a, a better interpretation of what seemed ominous. She didn't. Anyways, thank you for your question. November will mark 10 years Tanakh Talk has actually been on the air. Very excited about that. To support my work here at this channel where I have all the different rabbis and teachers, and a lot of people go straight to the rabbis and support them. I also do need your help, so I really ask you to consider donating to this channel on a regular basis if you can. TanakhTalk.com, there's a link there. There's also a Patreon link I'll probably have at the end of the video on an ad. I did an analysis over the past six months, and donation has dropped a lot on my side. Of course, I never talk about it. I only put the ad up sure. there. I have gigs that I do in the evening to help pay the bills and sometimes it's uh, it requires more than less but uh, if you guys have some to spare please send it in i could certainly use it to help us out with this channel okay nathaniel can you hear me okay buddy nathaniel is still on line with me here yeah so i i see our okay go ahead go ahead with your question it was breaking up a little bit earlier when we were talking so see if you can uh, make sure you're in good reach of signal and you get a good sound going through okay go right ahead okay Okay, so my question, my name, my name is Nancy Maslow, I'm from West Orange, New Jersey. My, I have two questions. The first one is the main one, so if I don't have time for the second one, it's fine. It's fine. My first question is on Numbers 25, five, uh, thir verse 13, from Parshish Pentecost, where it says, where Pentecost kills Zimri, and, and the Apostle says in the Gimel that all that, he was, that through killing Zimri, he was Mechapir from, he was by Mechapir, but he, so he atoned for, for B'nai Yisrael. So, how does that how does that fit in with Ezekiel eighteen that no, that the that the wicked cannot die for the sins for the sins of the righteous and in that same vein it's, uh, it's my next and um on Isaiah forty three verse verses um two three two three four where Hashem where Hashem, where Hashem tells the Jewish people that oh that if they, if they do tshuva that he'll oh, that he'll give the triumph and kush as a as a ransom for the as a ransom for them where them where be, where they basically be be punished in and, and the Jews said so it's uh, it's, a, it's, really, it's on the same question, it's in the same vein, how can like it, and how does that work with Ezekiel 18, that, in that people, that other people cannot pay for your, for your sins? Okay, we're going to just keep that one question per caller, just so everybody has time to, has the ability to get in also. Robert, would you right. restate his, I know you understood his question, but a lot of people in audio didn't, but it was really hard to understand what he was saying, if you don't mind. Yeah, um, I, the question is that we find in uh, Numbers chapter 25, uh, where we have the sin of the worship of Baal Peor, and we have the sin of Zimri, who was uh, publicly creating a chil Hashem, a desecration of God's name, by engaging in fornication with a Midianite woman. So the Torah says that he was put to death, and that... Uh, calm that brought about an atonement for the people now you, you could don't take this personally but you couldn't possibly have brought a don't take it personally but a worse example that means in the case of Zimri who was from the house who was from the tribe of Shimon he wasn't innocent Ezekiel 18 tells us that the innocent cannot die for the sins of the wicked right that's the whole point. If, if a person who is teaching sin uh, is, and, and not only teaching it, but he's doing it through his actions, so he's not innocent. So you couldn't possibly have brought an example that is less consistent with Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel 18 is describing vividly um an innocent person cannot die for the sins of the wicked the Torah tells the same thing we find jeremiah of course we don't want innocent people being punished for the sin for the bad behavior of the guilty of course we want the innocent exonerated and the guilty punished right everybody knows that god definitely knows that and god is a god of justice so using zimri as an example doesn't it's the exact opposite. It's, in Yiddish, we call it punk fuck hair. It's exactly the opposite. Okay. Okay, caller, you're live on the air. Go ahead with your question. Hi, Robbie Singer. I am so happy to be on the air with you. 
William, you guys do a great job. I listen to you on all the shows on, M- on uh, YouTube. I listen to them all the time. They're fabulous. Rabbi, I'm wishing a first lemur for your father. I hope he gets better Thank real you. soon. My question is this. How is it possible that the church leaders, even today, who study the Bible, study the New Testament, they don't see the same things that you're saying now? Meaning, don't they want to know the truth? So if these things that we're showing, that the, the discrepancies in the New Testament versus the actual Torah, how come they don't see this? How, how are they missing that actual boat? If what we have is the truth, shouldn't all church, all religions be seeking that same truth? How is it that they could still be per- perpetrating that same lie? Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Great question. Great uh, go ahead question. and hang up now and tune in for your answer. That's a great question. Um, Rabbi, that, that actually fit perfectly in line with the, with the written-in question. Somebody said it was actually in an argument, and it said, how could, how could Paul, an educated Jew, misunderstand the Torah and teach Christianity if, in fact, Christianity isn't true? So it kind of goes right along with this whole concept, if you want to just kind of knock that out. Right. All right. So let's, let's, just, let's just get right straight to the point. Uh, if you want to find, in my experience, uh, virtuous Christians who really are looking for the truth, don't look to the leadership. Because the leadership is very interested in membership and ties. In general, generally speaking, I have not been impressed with the leaders in the Christian world. I am impressed with the parishioners, and some of them are very studious, much more so than their leaders. The leaders are interested in making sure that that one commandment the church loves, tithes, is uh, is paid up. They want to make sure that, um, that they remain in power. Generally speaking, I'm not impressed with Christian leaders, and n- neither am I impressed with the scholarship of Christian leaders. So I think the reason you're asking this question is that rabbis, Jewish leaders, generally, generally are the most um, well-educated Jews. They know the most, right? Generally speaking, and that, that's true for the most part. And Balabatim, people who, are, who go to synagogue, they're, in the Orthodox world, they're all fairly, very knowledgeable. But it doesn't work that way in the Christian world. The Christian leaders are the people who are great organizers, who have a following, who are able to deliver that right sermon. But these are not the real scholars. But I think your real question still stands. How do good, um, well-meaning Christians, how do they believe this stuff? Why don't they look it up? So I'll explain to you what's happening. Now, first of all, there's something very striking going on. And that is that Christians look at Jews, I'm talking about nice Christians, look at Jews, and they're fairly bewildered. They're bewildered and wondering, why don't these Jews see that Jesus is the Messiah? I know many Christian leaders who tell me that's the question they're asked more, more frequently than the other uh, professors at Christian universities. Like, why don't the Jews believe this if it's so obvious? Cri- many Christians are absolutely flabbergasted by this, especially those who are philo-Semitic, those who have a favorable view of Jews are like, well, why don't the Jews are clever, it's their Bible, they can read it in its original language. They were in the land of Israel when Jesus walked this earth. How could they possibly, of all people, not be impressed? I mean, if somebody from the sub-Sahara doesn't believe in Jesus, well, they don't have that tradition. and Maybe they're surrounded by all sorts of pagan beliefs or whatever. But Jews is very problematic for them. And it's very, very difficult for them to work it out. And now, why is it that Christians believe in Christianity and are not, are frequently unmoved by um, when they read the Hebrew Bible? So Christians, for the most part, are not really reading the Hebrew Bible in its entirety, but reading very selected passages. It's just the way it is. 
There are some studious Christians that do, but it's a very small. You know, a Christian that has read the book of Isaiah from beginning to end just once, like, I mean, read it, not just, you know, but like read through it in English. You know, you know what, what percentage that is of the Christian world? I don't know. It's much less than 1%. It's probably one in a thousand, probably one in a thousand that have just read, if you took all the Christians in the world, I don't think it'll be more than one in 1,000. I'm being charitable, it's probably less than that. They don't read it. They don't read the book of Numbers. They don't read, it. they read selected, Passages. First of all, the, vest, the largest Christian denomination is the, the Roman Catholic Church, whose service is highly liturgical, highly structured. Same thing for the Orthodox Church. That's the second largest Christian denomination. They're, the services of these two huge denominations is high, highly structured. And what the Christians hear from the pew is what the priest teaches. That's it. Now, what happens to the Christians who are studying a little bit more, and there are. So what they're doing is they're reading the Hebrew Bible in a corrupt translation, so that doesn't help them, but they're reading it through a Christological filter, through a Christological grid. So they have there's they have so many handicaps. Number one, they're they're not getting what it actually says. The text has been deliberately corrupted. Number two is even if the translator is not deliberately corrupting it, it it's spun in a certain way. It because English cannot uh, English and Hebrew are not related to each other. They're not from the same family of languages, and in Hebrew there are just so many words that are. It's called a, a, a no copula, which means that they're not there. They're connectors that just don't exist. So they have to insert all these words in the English translation. And very often, um, translators will italicize those words that don't even appear. So every English translation of the Hebrew Bible is a commentary, is a commentary. That's on top of that. But here's what's really going on. The Christians are just reading the Hebrew Bible through a Christological filter. So when they read about um, Joseph in the book of Genesis, who ultimately is rejected by his brothers right, and, and is taken away to Egypt and his vicissitudes in the prison... Right? You know what they do? They go, oh, that's a picture of Christ. That's a picture of Jesus, who too was rejected by his own brothers. So what they do is they just read into it a Christology that it just isn't there. Well, how are you going to ever escape this spiritual, mental prison by doing that? It means, I mean, you can then, I mean, the Mormons do this also. I mean, Joseph Smith was murdered, was killed because of his religious beliefs. If Joseph Smith hadn't gone on that, on that journey of claiming that he encountered the angel Moroni, he probably would have died of old age. He wasn't. And Mormons do this too. Of course, it's, you know, and, and the Catholic Church engages in all this kind of, this is an allusion to that. And Protestants rightfully reject it, but they only reject it with regards to the, the Roman Catholic Church and the, those Roman Catholic traditions that the Protestant Church did not adopt, such as Mariology, uh, the transubstantiation, all these other... We don't have to go through that now. So what they're doing is, so every instead of looking at the story of Joseph and understanding how Yehuda emerges from it, uh, as a leader, which is so important, they miss it all. They miss it all. And they, Joshua encounters an angel of the Lord in the fifth chapter of the book named after him. That angel of the Lord is Jesus. Well, how are you going to get anywhere if you do that, right? And for you Christians, I want to talk to you. you. Remember what you were promised in the advertisement 
when you're considering becoming a Christian, what were you promised? You were promised that there's evidence, not through inference, but explicit evidence in the Hebrew Bible, not one, not two, but hundreds of passages in the Old Testament that all explicitly point to Jesus. Well, that's a f rather fantastic claim, right? And then what were you served? What were you given? You were given inferences, mistranslations, texts ripped out of context, Christians trying to apologize, meaning defend this scandalous methodology by claiming, well, the Septuagint agrees with the New Testament, the authors of the New Testament relied on the Septuagint. I know, I know what happened when you went to your pastor. Why? Because I have some special knowledge and I, um, I have prophetic. No, I, I've been doing this for more than 40 years. I know exactly what happened. This is what's going to happen to you when you go back to your past. They got it all lined up. They got all their books on how to answer the Jew. I'm telling you, this is what happens. And people want to know, you know, like, how do I answer? Because I, I, I want to, you know, I want to keep living my life the way I do. So there are people who could specialize and explain to you anything you want, they can explain it away. The, and what you're going to be served is Septuagint, so Septuagint, a Greek translation of the Bible, but I was told that the Hebrew is the one that matters. And I was told that the Hebrew is intact. And I was told that the Muslims are are, should be rejected because Muslims claim the Hebrew Bible was corrupted, right? Like all you Christians who argue with Muslims all day about the integrity of the Hebrew Bible, and you as Christians defend the integrity of the Hebrew Bible against Muslims who mostly believe that the text has been corrupted, you then turn around after that conversation with the Muslim and go to the Jew the Greek translation is more reliable than the original Hebrew. Could you imagine if you're in London where they have every Sunday people get together in that, that park, right? And they're all fighting, Muslims, Christians, Jews, it's a whole atheist, a whole craziness there, right? So imagine a Christian arguing with a Muslim, defending the integrity of the Hebrew Bible, and then when that conversation is done with, to turn to a Jew and say, no, the Hebrew Bible is so unreliable that we would rather rely on a Greek translation, which Christians claim the writers of the New Testament, including Paul, who wrote, it is said, wrote the majority of the Christian Bible, relied on the Septuagint. Why would they rely on the Septuagint? What? That's crazy. So that's what's going on. And and what really occurred was that the original Greek translation of the five books of Moses that was produced a quarter of a, let's just say 250 years before the Common Era for the Alexandrian Library was only the five books of Moses. I show in Let's Get Biblical, Volume 2, how... The Septuagint, even of the five books of Moses, has been completely corrupted. I'm not going to how I demonstrate it, but I demonstrate it. The, the prophets and the writings weren't even translated then. It's, these were later translations, subsequent translations to that original. And what everyone did in this cottage industry of translating the Hebrew Bible into Greek was they called it a Septuagint. Imagine that. Everybody gets to call it a Septuagint. Well, that's crazy. So you really think that when you go online or you go to Amazon and order a Septuagint, you think you're getting what 250 rabbis rendered 2,550 years ago. You know how crazy that is? Not only that, in the Septuagint that you order online or look up online has all the Apocrypha in it. It has books in it that were originally written in Greek like the wisdom of Solomon. This is insanity. All right, so first is the reason why good Christians, thoughtful Christians, we never want to go after people personally. We only want to deal with ideas, okay? Now, 
we all have crazy people. There are crazy Christians out there. There are who attack me daily. But, you know, when, when dogs bark, I don't pay attention, and neither do you. I'm not talking about the crazies out there. There, there are no shortage of them. But that's not, you know, we all have our nutcases. But talking about no, so the the reason why Christians are flabbergasted is because they're reading whatever of Tanakh that they are through a Christian filter. And then when they don't know how to deal with the problem that I present, instead of actually researching it, they just go to some booklet that tries to address these very serious problems, and they address them in such torturous ways. It's such, they engage in such sophistry, theological sophistry. It's mind-blowing. So that's why, so Christians, I write about this also in volume one of Let's Get Biblical. It's very odd that thoughtful Christians look at Jews and say, you know, they're pretty clever people. Talk about the nice Christian, you know, like him. And I'm just flabbergasted how the, a people who win nearly a third of the Nobel Prizes in the hard sciences, how people who are so intelligent, he, I mean, these are the people who keep me out of prison and deliver my babies. How could they be so dumb? How could they be so thick-headed? Really, that's how Christians are thinking. And what I want to do is now go the other way. And then why do Jews look at Christians and go, why do you believe this? And it's very simple. Jewish people are raised with the Hebrew Bible, with Tanakh, right? They hear the five books of Moses read aloud in the synagogue every week. And when we're in school as children, we're learning it in the Hebrew. It's just Hebrew is very easy. And it's, if you read Hebrew, it's easy to understand Hebrew. It's just easier to read in Hebrew than in English. It just is. Hebrew is less flexible. There are all these exceptions to the rules that exist in English. It's, the English ha is just a bloated language with way too many words to say the same thing. I don't have to explain to you. Okay, you know this. So what happens is, at some stage, at some point, Jewish people encounter Christianity, particularly in North America, in Europe. But the United States is a very religious country. I know if you're an American and don't travel much, you don't realize this. And you think of, well, look how America is so divided religiously. It is. But I assure you this, England is far more divided than the United States is spiritually. That means the majority of, of people living in, in England are atheists. They don't believe in God at all. The vast majority of Americans believe in God. It's a very, the United States is a very religious country, okay? But you have to travel to Europe to know this, or else if you live in your own echo chamber and just, you know, reading the New York Times and watching CNN, you're not going to get this because you're not going to know what's going on in other parts of the world. There are other places that are even more religious. In Indonesia, where I lived for many years, is a very, very religious place. I mean, people, whatever they believe in, but they're very, very religious. I never met a an atheist in Indonesia. Maybe there's one I just didn't encounter. Let's get to the point. Jewish people, at some stage, encounter Christianity and learn some things about the Christian religion and find out fairly quickly that Christianity predicates itself on Judaism and claims that it's a fulfillment of Judaism, that this is the true Judaism and the Jews somehow have been left behind, to borrow a term. So Jews then begin to examine the core claims of the church. I'm talking about Jews who have knowledge of Tanakh. And they're going, wait, there's nothing like this in the Hebrew Bible. The Messiah is supposed to die, and if you believe in him, you'll be saved, and if you don't believe in him, you're damned. There's nothing like that. It doesn't even say that in Isaiah 53. In fact, the only deal in Isaiah 53 is in Isaiah 53, verse 10, where God makes a deal with the servant. If you'll repent, so then you'll have children, have a long life, and, and so on. Just the opposite. It's a servant who, gets, who is given a deal by God. Not, so it's, it's, it's so backwards. So what happens is that Jewish people 
at some point are exposed to Christianity and realize that there is nothing remotely resembling this in the Hebrew Bible. On the contrary, the innocent can't die for the sins of the wicked. The Torah says that idea is an abomination. We're well aware of other religions that practice this idea, the Aztecs, the Mayans, why people travel to places like the Great Reefs in, in Mexico and see the altars of these ancient peoples that slaughtered uh, teenage girls, slaughtered them by the tens of thousands and take selfies there. It's a mokum avoidizara. It's a place of an abomination. I have no idea why people do this, but they do. They do it because um, that part of the world, you know, that area of Mexico has this, the second largest reef in the world. So divers are there, but people stop to, you know, Cozumel, they stop to see that. Why would you do that? Why would you ever go to a Makavi Desert? So Jews are examining the claims of the church and going, this bears no resemblance to anything. God is one, and he's one alone. Hero Israel, the Lord is the God, the Lord is one. How do you... How do you say that there's three persons in the Godhead? How could you say such a thing and be taken seriously? So here's what I want to share with you, what's really happening. Because there are good people on both sides, genuine people on both sides. But there is a big difference, and that is that the Jew is operating... I'm talking about Jew, I mean the religious Jew. I'm not talking about Bernie Sanders, okay? So what's happening is the religious Jew is, is reading Tanakh in Hebrew, reading Torah in Hebrew. And it's easier in Hebrew. It's, it's just simple in Hebrew. The, I'm not going into why, but it's easier in Hebrew. So the, they're reading Tanakh, and then they're encountering, at some point, you're encountering Christianity. And then you're going, what? There's nothing like that. That's completely alien and and Jews a reject and b truthfully scratch their head and go why would Christians believe this you understand that's really what's going on is so it's a very odd relationship that Jews and Christians have which we're each looking at each other I'm talking about the best circumstances and we're gazing at each other in bewilderment and each is saying to the other side how could you be so thick-headed on the, we don't say that, because it's not polite to say that, but that's really what's going on. Why? Because Christians are reading the Hebrew Bible in light, through the filter, through the Christological grid of the New Testament, and all the accretions of Christian tradition that developed after the New Testament. So they're reading it right into that. When Abraham greets the three angels, uh, the Trinity. Well, what chance do you have if you read the Bible that way? You know, and Jews are reading the Christian Bible or more likely encountering what Christians believe and going, wait, there's nothing like, you know, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one can come to the Father but by me, John 14. What? You can't come to God without Mashiach? That's, that's crazy. That's crazy. He died as a ransom for our sins, Matthew 20, 28. Mark ten forty five. What? Christ, the, the Mashiach, is the end of the law to everyone who believes. Romans chapter ten. What? The Torah is forever. Read the last passage of Deuteronomy twenty nine. What? The, when Mashiach comes, the Jewish people will diligently keep the mitzvot. See Ezekiel thirty seven twenty four and twenty five. It's Mamish says it explicitly, and you Christians. If you want to hate me, hate me. I would encourage you before you, when you, I know some of you like me and do respect me, but I encourage you to really open up these passages. You know, and, and, and just read it. It says, when the prince will come, who's David, the Jews will be keeping all the commandments in Torah and Mitzvot. What do you, take Paul and throw it in the garbage. I, I'm sorry to sound that way. I'm not trying to be provocative. 
But I care. I really care. And I understand how Christians can get themselves in that kind of trouble, really. But there's a day coming, and it's very soon. We are observing now tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Christians who are coming to the God of Israel as B'nai Noach converting to Judaism already have converted. It's in the hundreds of thousands. It may be in the millions. Why? And why is it happening now? Now it's 85 years after the Holocaust, right? What was going on 85 years before the Holocaust? None of this. Why now? It's happening now because we are in the, we can hear the footsteps of the Messiah. The birth pangs of Mashiach are unfolding now, and that's why the it is now fermenting and the events are happening now so people will notice, ah, it's time for us to do tshuva, it's time for us to repent. And that is my hope. It's my hope that Christians will examine this. It's not easy for them. Be patient with them. You know, they were told Jesus loves you, and they're taught that they'll go to hell if they don't believe this stuff. So you have to be very patient with them and carefully go through their questions, respond to them thoughtfully. Thank you so much for your insightful question. All right. Okay, moving on to our next caller. We have Moshe. Moshe, you're live on the air. Go right ahead. Hi, Kodar. I just want to say thank you to both of you, uh, Mr. Hall, for your amazing show. And needless to say, Kodar, you, um, you know, I'm first time, long time. Uh, you know, you were the first speaker that were really like the first one that helped me uh, come back to Hashem, like to do tshuva in three years. <laughs> three years yeah, ago, I remember to this day. Welcome That's home. awesome. Welcome yeah, I was sweetheart. very close to leaning to the other side because I had neighbors who were born again Christians, and you were so right. Like that happens at the dinner tables; it doesn't happen at the you know. And I right. was always over their house, and it was just like you said, always at the. And they didn't work for the church, but they would always preach, always. And I was best friends with their son. And one day, three years ago during COVID, I just needed to know, and you were the first one that just popped up and changed my life in three years, married, kids, it's, oh, Hashem, just... Baruch Hashem, Baruch wow. Hashem. I, mean, you, I want you to dive in for my father, please, because, you know, Rob, in the I was place, just going to say, Rob, Shlomo Zoman Ben Leach Cohen. I, I yes. believe me, <laughs> I, I, I pray for him, speed a quick recovery, Kodrav. Thank so, you. So, um, my, my question, uh, in the Parshat of the Spies, uh, after the plague, Moshe started praying on um, their behalf, and Hashem said that, I have forgiven him because of your word. Now this word, is that Hashem doing truth? Because I know that the Christians say that uh, we need the blood, but you eloquently disputed that by saying that the blood is only for intentional sins. Doesn't this kind of prove where Hashem says, I forget him because of your word? Is that word the actual tshuva for the intentional sin in that whole uh, parsha? There were not that... many people mm -hmm. who were involved in that specific sin. It wasn't mm -hmm. a lot of people. And thank God there were two spies who were loyal to Hashem. So the, the, the question is, if people trust in the spies and therefore turn their back on the God of Israel. Thank you for your question. Go ahead and hang up now and tune in for your answer, Moshe. Thank you for your call. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, imagine if people are trust in the spies who said, you know, there are giants in the country, in the land that we're supposed to conquer, and we look like we're gra In their eyes, we're like grasshoppers which is a very dangerous thing to do. Find Jewish people wondering, what will the Goyim say about us? Be very careful with that. Very careful. You hear that too often. What will they say about us? You have to stop thinking like that. Kodesh Baruch Hu made a promise. One um, memo, one point that should be made, is the Dor HaMidbar, the generation of the wilderness during that 40 years, were judged much more harshly than future generations were. There's not, it's not even close. Because they saw revelation, because they witnessed 
Kriyas Yamsev, the splitting of the sea, Mechemes Hamolek, they saw, they bore witness to the giving of Torah, they would judge on a much higher level than other generations were. For instance, the sin with the Zimri and the the Midianite women, we have other cases of men marrying outside the faith, and they weren't put to death for it. We have examples of people who didn't trust enough in Hashem, they weren't put to death for it. So on one point that a person must bear in mind is that the, the Jews who were in the wilderness were held to the highest possible standard and nothing else, nothing else. Because how could you not trust HaKadosh Baruch Hu? After all, you saw Muhammad HaMalek, you saw Kriyas Yamsov, you saw the Jewish people leaving Egypt 11 months with 10 plagues. They would judge harshly. But yeah, the people who did not trust HaKadosh Baruch Hu turned their back on the God of Israel. Of course, they would judge very, very seriously. But not others. I mean, Yeshua didn't um, participate in the, in this claim that the land cannot be conquered, right? Kolev didn't. Nothing happened to them. So you see that only those who are um, who participated in this were held accountable, not others. Okay, and this now. One point I'll make, it'll take 10 seconds. Tanakh is very skewed. The Hebrew Bible is very uh, skewed to emphasize every mistake and punishment. And it's not a history book of trying to really lay out to what extent did this occur, like how many people were involved in this. Torah is not, because Torah really is medicine and is trying to make us better people and using as illustrations the worst acts of treachery. So bear in mind that Tanakh is not a history book, but rather is using history in order to show us how to live our lives and what we should stay away from. You, But you can easily walk away from reading the book of Numbers and thinking, whoa, the Jews were just insane. Well, that's not the that's not what was really going on. Tanakh is very interested in the roaring mistakes. And you know, Elijah really thought that all the Jews had fallen away. God reminded him that there are seven thousand that are still faithful. So just bear that in mind. Anyways, thank you for your question. Lisa, you're live on the air. Go ahead with your question. Hi, Rabbi. She found the verse for us. Luke seventeen thirty three. By the way, I hope your father gets better. Thank you so much. So Luke seventeen thirty three basically is kind of like the left behind thing. Like, uh, you know, it says that Jesus will come like lightning in the sky, like in an instant. You know, one right. person be, two people will be, you know, plowing a field and one will disappear. Two men laying in one bed, which is kind of right. odd. I, <laughs> but go ahead, Lisa, and go ahead and specify your well, question. Beds are expensive. Yeah. Oh, I see. Um, okay. Is there um, something cultural that I'm missing? Because I know that you have to understand these things in cultural settings and not just, you know, read them. Is there something cultural I'm missing? No, not at all. Thank you for your question. I, well, her main question was about the two men. So I think she, I think you answered it already. So the beds were expensive. Well, so maybe no, no, no. There, there's nothing odd going. What is being conveyed is um, Luke 17 conveys the view of the third gospel author uh, in what's called the final kingdom, where one person will suddenly disappear and another one will still be there in the same circumstance. And of course, you don't want to be the one that's lost. You don't want to be the one that is um, that is sent to judgment. So that's what the end of Luke 17 is describing. Um, it's describing how some people will make it and some won't. And, you know, the, the greater context is that, you know, in the early stage of Christianity, the book of Luke was probably written about 85. So it's a time when... There's enormous upheaval. It's a time when 
the Jewish Commonwealth had been destroyed after the year 70. So Luke at least is written about the year 85. There are people who believe, scholars who believe that Luke is written in, in the second century. Um, and for reasons that are beyond the scope of this, I'm, I find it, this argument very compelling. I'm not convinced yet, but it's certainly worth it. But it's, it's late. And the idea is that you know, imagine living in a world that Christianity is not an officially recognized religion. Christianity is a religion that has endured some persecution. And it's telling people that you better remain loyal and faithful because when the day of judgment comes, one person is going to be snatched away, another one is going to be there. So there's nothing, you know, culturally odd coming. But, you know, the, the Gospels in particular are very engaged in a lot of apocalyptic discussion about the end times. And Luke 17 is very much a part of that, as is Luke 21, but differently. That's a great question. Thank you. Okay, going on with our next topic. This may be our last one, depending on how long it takes. Um, Color, you are live on the air. Go ahead with the question. This is James. Yes. Yes, yes. James Phoenix, uh, Rabbi, my thoughts and prayers to you, for your father. In Galatians 2.20, is Paul comparing himself to, to, to Christ? Is he trying to be Christ? Uh, um, yes. Okay, that's a good question. Cool. I didn't say what okay, go ahead and hang now. Thanks. Bye. Right. All right, go ahead. That's, real, that's a really very good, um, good question. And that theme is not unique to Paul. The idea of being crucified with Christ and that uh, each person taking up their own cross, that's not unique to Paul's letters. Um, but what's very intriguing is that Paul does present himself as a, as a Christ figure. In fact, interestingly, just two chapters later, and it's Galatians 4, Paul angrily says to the uh, churches in Asia Minor, you know, that was like modern-day Turkey, he says, said to them that, you know, when I visited you the last time, so Paul apparently was ill. And he said, you know, you really cared for me. You took care of me. You took care of me. And this is what's very striking. He says, like, like I was an angel of the Lord, like I was Jesus Christ himself. That's incredible that he would say that. So that's where Paul was, that he would say, like, like, like in this verse 14, he says, you, you receive me like an angel, Lord, like I was Jesus Christ. And that's how Paul portrayed himself. Paul portrayed himself as someone who's willing to die and suffer, uh, as sort of as Christ did. Paul does not uh, describe his death. In fact, Paul's death is a later uh, Christian legend that Paul was executed by Nero by being beheaded. Uh, that's that's all much much later. The Book of Acts ends with Paul being getting out of prison. Paul probably died in Spain, where his, I mean, in the western most part of the Mediterranean of Europe. That's and in fact, we Paul says that he after Rome he's going to Spain, in the Book of, um, in the Book of Romans, so. And then the term that, you know, if this whole religion is is not correct, then Christ died in vain. So Paul's letters, very famously, I know the Christians are listening to this, um, are thinking of 1 Corinthians 15. But Paul is uh, encouraging, demanding that his the readers of this letter to Corinth um, believe that Jesus uh, was crucified and rose on the third day, according to Scripture, verse 3 and verse 4, a Scripture, incidentally, that does not exist. And then Paul says that it's the same kind of language. Paul says that if, you know, if Jesus didn't rise, if this, this didn't occur, 
then we're all in our sins and our faith is completely in vain. It's for nothing. Well, it's, I wish it was for nothing. And actually, unfortunately, Paul, the most important convert to Christianity, spread Avodah was very successful in spreading the, this religion. And Paul was no doubt the reason why uh, Christianity succeeded. And the Branch Davidians didn't, because the Branch Davidians um, didn't have a Paul personality, someone that committed to spreading it, didn't have that to that extent. So David Koresh was killed along with many, many of his followers. There, it, 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 it's very similar to Christianity. It's the, the way David Koresh thought his apocalyptic thinking. You, but to the Jew, to the Jew, Christianity is exactly the Branch Davidians and Jesus is exactly David Koresh. Exactly. Same, same exactly. If you want to know how bizarre it is that to a Jew uh, that you should believe in Christianity, you ask yourself as a Christian, you know, how likely is it that David Koresh was in fact the Messiah? He actually had the name Mashiach, and his last name is a name that's called Messiah in Isaiah 45, verse 1. There are many other things about David Koresh that are very interesting. He actually came to Israel, studied in Jerusalem, and so on. Wow. So, but getting back, this was a theme that Paul uses frequently. Thank you so much for your question. Okay. Uh, Rabbi, I don't know how much time you've got left. We've got about 10 minutes left on you the go. hour and a half. I have a written one just real brief that you, will, you could probably spend a day on if you wanted to. Um, how do you respond to Christians when they say they believe in Jesus because of the proof, the proof that there was no body found in the tomb? That's, that's why they believe in Jesus. I'm just speechless. Like, how do you know there was no body found in the tomb? In fact, the earliest description of Jesus' resurrection does not mention an empty tomb. I'm talking about Paul. The oldest surviving Christian literature, the oldest, is Paul's letters. Okay? Unlike the Gospels that are written in the 70s, 80s, 90s, could have been, some of it could have been written into the 2nd century. Could have been, but let's stay, let's, let's steel man this. So Paul's letters are all written in the 50s, right? 50s is still, you know, two decades after the putative crucifixion. But... Paul doesn't mention an empty tomb ever, ever. Not once. In 1 Corinthians 15, the most famous chapter in Paul's letters, where he goes through and explains why you should believe in the resurrection, nowhere does he claim that there were women who came to the tomb and found it empty. Do you understand how the magnitude of that? Like, if you look at the Gospels, all four Gospels, it is women that come to the tomb and discover it to be empty, okay? Matthew, Mark, and Luke are different than John, but in this regard, not that different, except that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you have more than one woman, and John is just to Mary Magdalene, John chapter 20. I mean, Christians go on endlessly about women coming to the tomb and finding it to be empty. And none of those features are found in the oldest surviving Christian literature. There's no mention of the women discovering the tomb empty. In fact, there's no mention of anybody finding a tomb empty, empty in Paul's letters. So I don't... I don't I don't know why Christians don't notice this. Now, you're probably saying, well, um, well yeah, it doesn't mention that Jesus' tomb was empty. No, well, Christians are as are going to uh, 
respond initially by going, that's not possible. I'm, I'm not kidding. So right now, the Christians that are watching me and listening to me now are just going through Google right now. Right now, they're going through their New Testament trying to find why I'm wrong. They're going to discover that I'm not wrong. There's no mention of an empty tomb in Paul's letters. It, it's prominent in the Gospels, so the Gospels are much, much later. And there's no mention of the women discovering the empty tomb. That's all in the Gospels, much later, much later. And if I'm wrong about anything, I say often the book of Mark is written 70. It's probably later than that. You know, I think... Well, I'm going with the standard dating of Mark 70, Luke and Matthew 80, 85, and John 95, like that standard fare. I'm, I'm keeping it very conservative. I, I, for many reasons, I think it was written later than that. But you know how crazy that is? So it's not even there. Now, I know what you're saying. You're saying, well, doesn't Paul preach Christ crucified, you know, that Christ was crucified and he rose on the third day. So isn't rising from the tomb on the third day equal to an empty tomb? No, it's not. Well, what do you mean, Rabbi? Well, it's really very simple. In the ancient world, most people believed in an afterlife. Not all, but it was widely believed. Let's talk about the Greco-Roman world and beyond. We don't have to stay restricted to that. People believed in God. Uh, there were almost no atheists as we know that term today. There were people who didn't think that God or the gods were involved in human affairs. There were people like that, but an atheist is, uh, didn't really exist then. I've not encountered it. But here's what people did not believe. People did not believe, except for the Jews, that the physical body would resurrect from the dead. What In the Greco-Roman world, it was widely believed that there is an afterlife. But that afterlife was a spiritual life. So the person was transformed from a physical body into a spiritual body. No one wanted to go back to that physical body, which they saw as a broken <laughs> a broken vessel? I mean, the ancient world? Look, if modern medicine didn't exist, I'm talking to you, would you be alive today? Probably the answer is no, right? If I ask you, you're watching me now, if modern medicine did not exist, would you be alive right now, right? Not all of you, but a great deal of you going, no, actually, I'd, I'd be dead. So imagine the ancient world that was just full of people just dying in enormous pain. Young, usually, there are people who dodge bullets. There are. You know, my grandmother got tuberculosis before they came up with antibiotics. She was a young woman and in the 1930s. And they sent her off to, I think it was Colorado, and she was there, it took her a few years, and she beat it. She did, she was a young girl, she was a mother at that time, she was a mother of three children. Um, she beat it, but she was a young woman, you know, so you have a shot at beating it, of course. So the ancient world was full of just broken bodies, miserable, people didn't know what hygiene was, they couldn't shower, they didn't brush it, don't ask, it was a nightmare. People, and I say brush teeth, the thing that would probably kill you more than anything was your teeth. People died of, in, of infections coming from their mouth. So imagine all that. Why would you want to go back to that? And that's why Paul speaks about in that same chapter that the resurrected spiritual body of Jesus was strikingly different than the physical body of Jesus prior to the crucifixion. So there, here, here's the key. In the Greco-Roman thinking, whatever goes on in the tomb is not relevant. It's a spiritual body, an ascendancy of a spiritual, a spirit body that emerges. That's why there's no resurrection for Romulus, for Alexander the Great. There's ascensions of these 
great gods of the Greco-Roman world, but not physical resurrection, where the body literally becomes uh, alive again and then walks out like a living person. That, that's not what people thought. And people thought that the Jews were crazy. People really, although Judaism, I think it probably somewhat like today, something like today, but although Judaism is a, let's say it's a respected religion, the one thing people could not get over is why did Jews want or believe that the physical body would be resurrected? They didn't, like, didn't know what you, like, why would you want to go back to that wretched body? And Paul refers to his body as this wretched thing. There's a reason for that. So, right, so what we find in, in Paul's letters is, he means, in, for as far as Paul's concerned, there could be a physical body in the tomb, but Jesus could rise from the dead, but it's a spiritual body. And he talks about it in 1 Corinthians 15. That doesn't mean there isn't a physical corpse in, in a tomb. That's why he doesn't use the term um, an empty tomb, because in the Greek mind, you can rise from the, you would rise from the dead and have an afterlife, but that, what, that has nothing to do with the physical body being in the ground or being in a tomb. Do you follow? Now, what happens is this view of Paul is going to be rejected by the church. And we see that in the Gospels, where starting with, with Mark, there is an empty tomb, right? And, and then Matthew, it's more elaborate because Matthew actually ends with Jesus encountering disciples, same thing as Luke. Luke is wants to show you that Jesus is not a spirit, so he's eating burnt fish and says, look, I'm not a spirit. What spirit do you know could you know, eat and drink? So Luke is pushing hard. And the story of Thomas that's found only in the book of John is pushing against it further. So they're all together pushing back against the ideas that emerged from Paul. That's the one area that Paul uh, lost in. So, um, so a as it turns out, there, there's no mention of an empty tomb in, in Paul's letters. That's a, a, a later development of a physical resurrection as we see in the, um, as we see in the Gospels. So it's really a remarkable thing that there's no mention of a physical resurrection. Paul uses a seed as an example of something that you plant in the ground, it dies, and what comes out, the plant, is something completely different. And that's how he compares the physical body of Jesus to the resurrected body. But as I said, that's the one area, Paul, although Paul wins in other areas, meaning the church will adopt his theology, his doctrines, they don't adopt his view of the resurrected Jesus. And for the church, it'll be that he physically rose, and that's gonna find its way very clearly in three of the four Gospels. Mark is unique because it ends at chapter 16, verse eight, and we don't have an encounter with the risen Jesus in Mark chapter 16. What you see from verse nine through 20, those 12 passages, is a later interpolation. But we certainly see it in the, um, in the other three Gospels. So thank you so much for your thoughtful question. Very good. Well, that definitely wraps yeah. us up, Rabbi. Uh, again, Refuel Shlema for your father. Um, Thank you so much. I'm, I'm hoping for the full 120 plus uh, for sure. Amen. Possible. Amen. So. Amen. You all have Amen. a great week. Be sure to go to Rabbi's website, outreachjudaism.org, to find his two-volume book set there. The CDs are not available, but the audio files are. Just click the free audio tab at the top. You'll find corresponding titles that match the book and the CDs. It's not an audio book. It's extra information. So if you are doing one without the other, as Rabbi would say, it's like kissing God through a towel. You want to get both those. And if you already have a copy, buy more copies. Give them to your Christian neighbors and friends. And uh, be a light. Love you guys. Yeah. Take care. Shalom. Hello, my dear friends. Hope this message finds you well. If you like the way this channel is going and the channel has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting the channel by going to the website, tanaktalk.com, T-A-N-A-C-H-T-A-L-K.com. Thank you once again for your time and for supporting Tanak Talk. Shalom.
chuva 